going to get harder to get back to yes, because every time they open a new uh, mall, a new real estate development, a new anything, people rush in and build stuff. And if you get there late, like if you want to open an important new building in New York City now, it's a lot harder than it was 50 years ago. We're building buildings in the metaverse. We're building followings in the metaverse. So my blog isn't better than many other blogs on the topic, but I've been doing it for 10 years. And so I have people who have, I've solved their marketing blog problem and they're not looking for an alternative. So if you want to start one just like mine, there's no room to be the next Seth Godin because I'm still here for now, right? <laughs> And so you need to be the next whatever your name is, right? The first one, I mean. And that is the opportunity, right? The opportunity is now that there's just been the total reshuffling of the deck, now that Condé Nast isn't going to matter and Fox isn't going to matter and CBS isn't going to matter, you could matter. But once other people start carving out territory, it's going to get more difficult. So, so the question is, there's all this information. There's so many tweets to follow and people on Facebook and blogs to read and everything else. How do you keep up and how do you filter it? Here's the thing, you, when you talk about the people with the mad skills that you admire, who built stuff that matters, you rarely say, she did it because she was so incredibly informed. She did it because she was so incredibly in sync with all the stuff that had been posted yesterday. In fact, that's never true. That we do that to distract ourselves from the things we fear. And what we fear is, being criticized, being called out as a fraud, being identified as a poser, being called out as someone who had no right to do the work that they just did. So we say, well, before I do more of that, let me just check to see if someone's already done this idea. Let me just check to see what the output of this is. And the, the one that drives me absolutely crazy is let me see who's live tweeting that event that I'm not at so I can read these very tiny little pithy things that mean nothing and waste half an hour, right? <laughs> Anyone who's reading that stuff is hiding. They don't need the information. The information that's coming in is merely keeping them from doing scary work. And so I think that it's entirely appropriate to go on a radical information diet, to turn it off for a day, a week, a month, and force yourself to do something that might get you fired, might get you run out of town, might get you embarrassed. Because it's only when you do that work that you be, create this vulnerability for yourself. That when you do that work, you're send, saying to your audience, here, I made this, what do you think? And you don't have to give them a knife and, and let them you know, hurt you. But you do have to be able to say, I made this. And all the information in the world isn't helping you make more stuff. You have enough, you should stop. Sure, so the question is, what, what do I mean when I'm talking about a story? Now, I don't mean once upon a time kind of stories. Stories work when they resonate with stuff we already believe. So if I told you a folk story from Uganda, it probably wouldn't resonate with you because you didn't grow up with the memes and the ideas that are related to what's in the story. Whereas if I tell you the story, uh, you have kids in school, and I say uh, a lamp started on fire because of PCBs, 12 kids are in the hospital, instantly, you leap into action. There's no analysis of the statistical risk of given how many light bulbs there are and how many kids have ever gone to the hospital that this is some urgent problem. But if you have a kid, particularly in a school like that one, you're going to freak. Because that story, it's not facts that matter to you. It's the resonance of imagination and where could this lead. So if we think about the stories that worked at Dell Computer, eight years ago, and the stories that worked at Apple Computer eight years ago, totally different. That you couldn't go to someone at Dell and say, we want to do a device that no one ever done before, and it's insanely great, and we can't be sure it's going to work, but it's going to involve new manufacturing techniques. They'd throw you out. Whereas if you told exactly the same story to a client at Apple, you'd get ushered into the, the nice room where they'd want to hear it, more of it, right? <laughs> and the reason is because they were already carrying around a bias. And so when we think about all the things that succeed around us, so there's you know, a restaurant in Midtown called Michael's where all the big publishing hoo-hahs eat lunch. Well, the story of Michael's isn't quick in and out, low calorie, or a good value, right? The story of Michael is, well, you know, Barry Diller will be at this table and some other person will be at this table and you'll be right between them and they'll see you and then one day, because they saw you at lunch, they'll call you and ask you to do a big fancy project. Now, they don't use those words, but clearly that's the way they organize the building. 
right? And so when you think about how great designers build their reputation, some of it is they're really good with a mouse or a pen, but a lot of it is they are building and living a story in everything that they do. And that's what they're getting paid for. They're not getting paid to do the stuff they love, which is the drawing and the mousing. That's where we get hung up. We get hung up in thinking that that's our job. It's not. Our job is getting our work in the world, getting our work to work. So how do you determine which stuff is going to matter? And this goes back to learning how to see, right? That learning how to see, figuring out where the opportunities are, that's what design really is. That it's not craftsmanship. It's seeing the gap and visualizing in advance what is going to work. So I've been doing marketing for a really long time. And I went out to India to do work with, with Acumen. And I was helping a, a, a nonprofit there that sells um, glasses to people who need reading glasses. And they'd been doing it for a couple years and it had been struggling. And I'm sitting there and it's a, I've got jet lag and it's 100 degrees. And I won't go into all the details of the story, but it took me about a minute to see something that other people hadn't seen. And by changing that thing, a whole bunch of good things came from it. Well, I couldn't have done that the first week, year, or decade I was in marketing, because I didn't know how to see. But when I was there, I had done it enough times and interacted with enough people that I saw what was missing. So part of the challenge here is you can't be disconnected from the output of your work. That you need to figure out how did someone use that last thing I made, and what did you learn from what worked and what didn't, and how can you do it again? So if you talk about the great guys at Warby Parker and their business is going great, right? They don't have words for why the glasses they're selling work better than different, but they can see, they understand. And part of the reason they understand is they've been in that business for a long time. And when they have their little showroom, they see who pe people come in, they see which glasses they touch, they see what they say. Immersing yourself in those interactions teaches you how to see. But the minute it stops, and it turns into just flagellating yourself reading the comments on a tweet you posted, you need to stop. Because now you're, you're hiding, you're not learning anymore. And that's why there is no manual for this, is that I can't tell you where that line is. I can tell you that if you're busy reading the comments, if you're busy spending your days retweeting and you know, sort of social grooming, you're probably not learning how to see in a way that's going to lead to work that matters. I was talking to us in the party earlier. We were laughing about what the genre is that you write, and you, Michael, I have an awesome program like that. And we said that you were writing the best of the genre. But what do you actually define that genre in? You mentioned in politics and economics. Sure. What is that genre? Yeah, that's a great question. There is a bookstore, I have a picture you know, on my computer. That, you know, they had romance, mysteries, business, history, and then they had a section called Famous Authors. They, that's what it said, <laughs> Famous Authors. And that made me really sad that there are people who go to the bookstore and say, I'm only willing to look at books from famous authors. <laughs> the word genre is really important. Right? It sounds a little bit like generic, but it means that we are pre-processing choice selection for people. That people can't possibly, there's going to be a million books published in 2013. People can't possibly consider a million books. But they can say, I like this genre of stuff. Now, you know, I, I got into the book business 28 years ago when, in a good week, 18 business books got published. Right now, it might be 18 every couple hours. One of the things that I helped pioneer, I certainly wasn't the only one, Tom Peters was way before me, is the idea of books where we talk about business and society and life all in a circle in a way that are fun to read. And that doesn't have a name. The whole genre has shifted. You really can't get away with writing a book like they used to write in 1970 in this category. So it evolved. One of the things that I think we're seeing, though, and, and Malcolm is far better at this than I am, is if you write something that people need to refer to in order to express an idea, it will spread. So after the tipping point came out, what would happen is people would go to a meeting and they'd say, I think our business is coming near a tipping point. And other people would say, what does that mean? Because they hadn't encountered the book yet. And so the same thing happened uh, with Purple Cow and the same thing happened with idea viruses and other phrases or concepts, right? So many, how many of you have read Chris Anderson's The Long Tail? Raise your hand. How many of you know what The Long Tail is? 
Interesting, right? So you don't have to read the book to get the idea. The book is just the wrapper for how the idea is going to spread. And what I've been thinking about for a long time is that the wrapper business changes faster than the idea business. So the wrapper of a book is going to go away really soon. But ideas are spreading further and faster than ever before. So as people who are interested in creativity and design, you need to think partly about your ideas and a lot about your wrapper. Because if you wrap your idea in something that can spread, it is more likely your idea will spread. And if your idea is one that demands to be talked about, it is way more likely it will be talked about. If an idea is easy to spread and is talked about, you win. And, and the cool thing is I have never once met anyone who said to me, everyone who I care about knows about my idea, but I'm having trouble making a living. That never happens. So you don't worry about charging tickets for tickets. You worry about getting the idea to spread. And if you do that, the revenue will take care of itself. OK, so the, the question has to do with how do we think about competition in the world of corporate politics, where you know, there's 10 people at GE, and one of them has to get fired every year. And there's 15, that's the rule. And there's 15, <laughs> you're laughing. Jack Welch came up with this idea that you have to go, everyone in the middle management has to go to their boss and say, I have 10 people in my group, this is the bottom 10%, and that person's going to get fired. And that was part of the model that he built of this very cutthroat competitive environment, which is great for people who like that, and for people who don't, good for them to not work there anymore, right? And I, I happen to think it's not a place I'd want to work f f at all, and, and it's changed quite a bit since he left. Um, but you knew that going in, I hope. Now, all of that is based on the work that Henry Ford and other people did a really long time ago. And the model was a few people who make decisions and tens of thousands of people who do what they're told. And so if you look at the River Rouge plant that Ford had in Dearborn, there was you know, three or four people who would say, this is what the car is going to be. And then there's 5,000 people who are going to assemble it. Well, as that profits, you create middle management, what were called pivot men. And the goal of a lot of people at the bottom, go-getters, was how do I get that job where I don't have to lift heavy objects, right? But where I just am the intermediary between people who are making decisions they can get blamed for and people who have to do the work. So we, that's where it was created. And it's built on scarcity. That the entire model of the industrial economy is scarcity. Scarce shelf space, scarce resources, scarce middle manager jobs that pay really well. And so in that world, it is very much a zero-sum game because there's musical chairs. But in the connection economy, which is where we're going now, it's not about scarcity. It's about abundance. Because you can have as many connections as you can handle. And you can follow as many people as you want. And you can put as many ideas in the world as you want. These are all abundant principles that aren't based on scarcity. So where I think this is going is people who go to work with a scarcity mindset, with the sharp elbows and trying to push their way in a game of musical chairs, are, are chasing a dwindling resource. And some of them will get it, but more and more people won't because the number of great middle class jobs that are available keeps going down. But those who show up and say, wow, this is abundant. This is a platform, a platform for me to do my art, a platform for me to take risks, a platform for me to make connections. And I'm probably not going to be working here in a year. But it's OK, because the, the weaving I'm doing, the network I'm creating in the best sense of the word network, will create more value for everyone I touch. And if you are in the business, of creating value for everyone you touch, you will never need to look for work for the rest of your life. But the people who play the scarcity game will always need a better resume to fight out the other guy. So the, the last part on this, um, and Tina will tell me when I have to stop, but the last part on this is, uh, back when I was running Yo-Yo Dine in like 98 or so, I was at Disney uh, for a meeting. And this guy had a pile of paper on his desk this thick. And I said, what's that? He said, oh, those are resumes. These are all the people who want to come work for me at Disney. And it was a lousy division of Disney, doing lousy work in lousy conditions. And it was literally this thick. And on my desk at Yo-Yo Dine, the number of graphic designers who had uh, replied to my last uh, thing, which was a full page ad in the New York Times, was four. <laughs> and the reason was because in the scarcity mindset, that's a good job at a famous company with a brand name where if you can follow instructions, you can get it. Whereas mine looked risky. It wasn't famous. You didn't know what it was going to blah, blah, blah. But the people who ended up with me, I can tell you what they've gone on to do. Really cool stuff. Because 
I'm a good client. I said, go ahead, do something that might not work. Go ahead, break some rules. Let's see what will happen. And yeah, I'll even let you take credit if it works. But finding that, so back to where we started, is finding that niche for yourself isn't going to happen because you write a better resume. It's going to happen because you've orchestrated all the work you do to end up in that place at that time as the one and only person that they need to trust to do this building for them, this community organizing. Okay, so I don't think connecting is the way, the kind of connecting I'm talking about. I don't buy into the whole trading lunches thing of saying, I'll follow you if you'll follow me. Who's in your network? Who's in your network? How can I get known by people because I've been in their face, right? I, I don't collect business cards anymore. I don't even have a business card. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is when your work goes into the world and touches people, then you are connected to them. Not because you showed up, but because your work showed up. It's the work product. So, you know, I was connected to Tina long before I met her. And no one introduced me to her that I recall. She was just in the atmosphere. And then I saw the work, and I saw more of the work, and I saw more of the work. And I said, this is someone I feel a connection. I would miss her if she was gone. And it's that idea of being missed is how we get past Dunbar's number. We can't figure out how to have more than 150 people who are likely to come to our funeral because they're our friends. But we can have way more than 150 people who would miss our work if we stopped making it. And that's what I'm talking about. So they're one and the same thing. How do we give this message to our youth? I work with some of the most brilliant teenagers, like in the Bronx, that are creative, but they're scared to fail. Right. They go to school where they're not allowed to fail, so they don't share their art. Right. Like, how do we, like, what do I do? What do I say? Right. So, you know, there's a small answer and the bigger answer. Let me start with the bigger answer. I wrote a manifesto a year and a half ago called Stop Stealing Dreams. You can find it online. I wish every parent would read it, because if parents read it, they might ask better questions, like, what is school for exactly? And maybe we wouldn't have this whole regime of number two pencils. Um, but setting that aside, you are one person. What I do when I teach is create an environment where not only is it safe to fail, it's required to fail. I make people more afraid of not failing than they are of failing. And one of the things I talk about is if you are serious about creating innovation in your company and you run it, one thing you have to do is fire people on a regular basis for not innovating. You have to bring someone up in front of them and say, this person made quota every year for the last five years, has never once had something failed, has never put anything into the world that didn't work, you're fired, right? <laughs> and then you give the parking space of the month to the person who did something with the right intent that didn't work. If you do that a couple times, the whole organization gets the message, right? Whereas if you just say that, but then give the A's to the kids who get all the right answers, you're not serious. And when we can create these environments for bravery, these environments where people can stand up and say, I made this, and it's not for you, but it is for you, then they're more likely to do it when they're adults. The cool thing is, we're giving all of you this playground to do this in. And some of you are kids compared to me. And you can. But what I can hear up here, like from my telepathetic skill, is you've got this whole dialogue in the back of your head saying, well, it'll never work, and it's not my turn, and it's not, it, that's easy for him to say because he got in early, and he knows GM, and that this person knows this person. It's not for me. This club is already closed. It's not, uh, no, that's not what is actually being said. What's being said is, I'm afraid that we're afraid to put work in the world that will connect to people. We're afraid to say, here, I made this. We're afraid to say, you know what? This isn't good enough. I better do it again. And that fear, overcoming it, that's our job, is to figure out how to raise the bar, not to copy the people we admire, but to become the people we admire. If you're the person that's in the connection business, um, storytelling business, and you understand that you need to focus on the people that will get it. So as you're in that process, how do you navigate that feat when some people who are getting it are not the ones that you want to be connected to because maybe there's not the financial part attached to it that's beneficial, but you want to keep pushing sure. to get to the ones that you know if they hear the story, will get it. Yeah, that's a really complicated mapping question, which is, you need to figure out what gets an idea from here to there, right? 
And so if this person is the person who specs new product design for Target, you've got to spend a lot of time thinking, well, how did that person get influenced on this? And how did that person get influenced on this? And you can draw maps. And you can say, this is the route that people have taken. But this route also works sometimes. And this route, but never once has the sending a really clever cardboard box filled with stuff I find in the dump worked. So don't do that one if you want to follow a path that's worked. But the, what I'm arguing for is that the path of send in your resume and wait to get picked, that isn't the path. There are many, many, many other paths. Just abandon that one and put yourself on the spot to sort of cartographize your way into the one that works. Thank you again, guys. I appreciate it.